Linda, it's so good enough to be here this morning. Amen. Uh, it's nice to have the piano. Amen. It's better than a CD, right? <laughs> Remember those days? Remember praying for a pianist, and we had one sitting right amongst us. Amen. Didn't know how to do it yet, but uh, isn't that how the Lord works? Say, man, Lord, why don't you send us a pianist, and it's us, right? <laughs> Lord, I sure want to do something for you. And the Lord says, well, why don't you do this? Well, I don't want to do that. Lord, I want to do something for you. Lord, I just don't understand why you don't send us to do, send me to do something. And the pastor asks you, why don't you do this? And you're like, ah, that's not for me. We continue to pray and ask the Lord to have us do something. And all along, the Lord has given you things to do, and we don't want to do them. Amen. It's not about whether or not you're good enough to do the job. It's whether or not you're humble enough to accept it. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Well, let's open our Bibles, if you would, back to 1 Samuel uh, chapter 19. Amen. Uh, uh, we've been going back into 1 Samuel for some time, and you know what's interesting? I remember going to Bible college, <clears throat> and uh, I remember when the Lord called me to preach, one of the things that I was afraid of the most, not just getting in front of everybody, everybody but was, uh, what in the world am I going to preach? Huh? I remember uh, talking to uh, our sending pastor when we started the church here, and I remember telling him, I was like, well, Brother Sutton, I think I've pretty much preached everything. I've preached out. I, I have preacher's mind, amen. And he goes, well, there's quite a few things. And I said, what do I do? He says, pray and read the scriptures. I said, well, I'm doing that, amen. <laughs> I says, I can't find anything. Uh, that's the problem, amen. Don't really have to look too hard, do we? One thing I've learned is that no matter where you are in the word of God, God will speak if you'll only listen. But anyways, we're, we started in 1 Samuel chapter 19 last week. We are in verse number 8. Uh, I did find out for sure that David's wife here's name is not Michelle. I, I want it to be Michelle uh, because English uh, people here in America think it's funny to call a woman Michael. But just I made sure of it, but her name is Michael. I know it's going to be hard. <laughs> But in all reality, if we weren't able to say it in Hebrew, uh, it wouldn't sound anything like what we're saying, right? And so, but her name is Michael, so we're going to have to call her Michael. I know that sounds funny, but we're going to do it the, how it's supposed to be pronounced. I like Michelle better, don't you? <laughs> Amen. Well, let's start in verse number 8. That's where we're at. Verse number 8 is basically our springboard here. And it says, and there was a, there was what? <clears throat> War again. And David went out and fought with the Philistines and slew them with a great slaughter, and they fled from him. Now notice, and an evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul, as he sat in his house with his javelin in his hand, and David played with his hand. Now notice what we just read in verse number 8. He already fought, right? And now all of a sudden an evil spirit is on Saul again. And Saul sought to smite David again, even to the wall with a javelin again. But he slipped away out of Saul's presence. We can always put that in there again. And he smote the javelin into the wall again. Which this, this is not the first time. And David fled and escaped that night again. And Saul also sent messengers unto David's house to watch him and to slay him in the morning. And Michael, David's wife, told him, saying, If thou save not thy life tonight, tomorrow thou shalt be slain. So Michael let David down through the window, and he went and he fled and escaped. And Michael took an image and laid it in the bed and put a pillow of goat's hair for his boister and covered it with a cloth. And when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, He's sick. And Saul sent the messengers again to see David, saying, Bring him up to me in the bed, that I may slay him. When the messengers were come in, behold, there was an image in the bed with a pillow of goat's hair for his uh, boister, bolster. And Saul said unto Michael, Why hast thou deceived me so, and sent away mine enemy, that he has escaped? And Michael answered Saul, He said unto me, Let me go. Why should I kill thee? So David fled and escaped and came to Samuel to Ramah, this is smart, and told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and dwelt 
and Naoth, Naoth, right, James? <laughs> and it was told Saul, saying, Behold, David is at Naoth, Naoth in Ramah. And Saul sent messengers to take David. And when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying, and Samuel standing as appointed over them, the Spirit of God was upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. And was told Saul, he sent other messengers, and they prophesied likewise, and Saul sent messengers again the third time, and they prophesied also. And then went he also to Ramah, and came to the great well that is in uh, Suchu, and he asked and said, Where are Samuel and David? And one said, Behold, they be in uh, Naoth, uh, Naoth and Ramah. And he went thither to Naoth and Ramah, and the Spirit, the what? The Spirit of God was upon him also. And he went on and prophesied, and he came to Naoth and Ramah, and he stripped off his clothes also, and prophesied before Samuel in like manner, and lay down naked all that day and all that night. Wherefore, they say, is Saul also among the prophets. Dearly Father God, Lord, we pray again. Lord, we've all we already prayed, Lord, that our hearts and our minds would be open. But Father, will you meet with us? And Father, just as when we gave our offering, we say we need you, Father. We come before you before the message and we say, Father, speak to us. We need you. Father, just as Samuel said when he was young, Lord, here am I. Father, speak to us. And Lord, I pray, Lord, we'd be attentive and hear. And Lord, uh, use uh, the word of God to help mold us, Lord, to be more like you in Jesus' name. Amen. I pray that God uses me. Amen. I'm just a man just like you are. But we had a good time on uh, last Sunday. We looked at the introduction. The title of my message is, uh, We Are at War. Amen. All of us have some kind of war, don't we? Uh, we notice here that in verse number 8, we're going to go back here and look at this verse one more time. And the Bible says, and there was war again. <clears throat> Don't you get tired of that? Huh? You know, my, I'm sure my wife gets tired of that. And we're at war again. I'm not talking about fighting and bickering. I'm talking about a mental war. I'm talking about the fight that we have spiritually. We're at war, friend. If you don't think that we're at war right now, there's something wrong with you. You say, I don't understand why all these things are happening. I'm explaining them to you. It's war time. It's time to put on your war paint, so to speak, right? Here it is. Here's your war paint. Here's your armor. It's all right here. We're at war again. I want you to see here, David's been at war. It was a continual war. We've already looked at his life last Sunday, and he had a war with his own family. They thought he was a joke. Right. Well, you don't need to bring in David. He's the least, and he's tenting the sheep. Samuel's like, no. Bring David because God says none of the other sons are the ones that he's going to anoint to be king. Guess what happened when David came in? He's the one. Huh. You know, what's interesting is that's how kind of how we feel when God calls us. It's not me. It's not me. And God says, yes, it is. Right? Why don't you quit saying it's not me and just listen. I'm trying to tell you as your pastor, we're at war and sometimes you're the one fighting against it. Why not fight? Why fight against the one who's for you? Good question, huh? You know what's interesting? We find that David, he fights his battles in the spirit of the Lord. Amen? You know, he understands how to walk in the Spirit. Now, I want you to see something here in verse number 8 as we go through here. It says, and there was war again, just like there will be with you. I don't know what your battle is, but I know there is a battle. And it says, and David, what did he do when there was war again? When he understood there was war again, he didn't stay at home. When he understood there was war again, he didn't get discouraged. I just beat these guys. 
when he understood there was war again, he didn't blame it on Saul. Which, I mean, really, come on. I mean, didn't David just see Saul hiding? And Come on now, he, he's understood where Saul stands. Hasn't David been there while Saul was offering up sacrifice? That's Samuel's job. And didn't ask for forgiveness. Hasn't David been there while Saul has been discouraged and played the harp? Isn't it interesting how David understood all of the bad that's going on, but we don't see him negative. It doesn't say that, hey, David understands there's war, and I'm sick of fighting everyone else's battle, and I'm out of here. No, it doesn't say he left. Hmm. Boy, that'll make me cry, won't it? I know a lot of preachers where the battle got tough, they left. Right? Hey, guess what? When the paddle gets tough, it isn't time to leave. Right? Do you know when you do that in the military, what's that called? Is that the thing that you're supposed to do? Huh? You know, we learned some things yesterday in the men's Bible study. Uh-oh. Uh Uh-oh. What was the title of it? James, what was the title of yesterday's Bible study? Not Forsaking Righteousness. I knew it. I was just making sure he remembered. I want to call him out on the live stream. Just making sure he's paying attention back there, right? Amen. Not Forsaking Righteousness and the Cost of Sin. You know, I don't think David forsook righteousness and the cost of sin, but Saul did. Let me tell you something. When you do that, God's protection's removed. That's Bible right there. The Bible says it doesn't mean you lose your salvation. It means you lose your protection because it's called willful rebellion. When you choose to do what you know is wrong, in the eyes of God, he's looking down and he knows you know it's wrong. It's willful rebellion. I'm just trying to help. There's a war. And the sad thing is, most of the time it's you. And it's willful rebellion. Let me tell you, you know what the Bible says about willful rebellion? That there remains no sacrifice for sin. Do you know what that means? That don't mean that you're lost. Do you know what that means? How many of you, come on, help me. Do you know what that means? You're going to pay for it. Do you know what that means? That before you die, this body, even as a child of God, you're going to pay the judgment for it. I don't know what it is. I don't know what you willfully do that you know is wrong. My Bible says God removes the payment for that sin and you're going to pay for it. I remember a lady that we still love today. And I know we'll see her in heaven one day. And I don't know why that brings tears to my eyes. But I miss her. She's a pain in my neck. Her name was Darla. But she was willful. And I remember when the payment of her sin came reckoning. And I remember being at her Beth bed at her hospital. And she was so positive. This goes right with the scriptures. People who are willfully choosing wrong are usually so positive. They believe that God, even though they've chose to sin, that God's just going to look over it. And not do anything. Let me tell you, that's not true. Brother Jim, I prayed for her. I knew with all my heart. And she goes, God's going to cure me. I says, no, he's not. She goes, yes, he is, preacher. You watch. I says, he's not. I wasn't being mean. I says, Darla, we love you, but God's calling you home. Do you know what in a week? went by and she went home and God says I'm done you need to come up here and talk to me I don't know about you I don't really want God calling me home like that that almost sounds like come up here buddy you're in trouble 
Now, she didn't go to heaven and get a spanking, but God says, you're done making a mess down there. Just so you know, you can choose your sin, but God's going to allow you to have your consequence. Are you listening to me? I, 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 like the, I like that Bible principle that you can choose the sin but not the consequence, but I like hearing it this way better that God's going to let you have your consequence because usually the sin that you choose has a consequence that you already know and God's going to let you have it. Just like a magnet. And here we see, and there was war again, friend. There's going to be a war tomorrow. Maybe there will be a war this afternoon, whether you come to church tonight. Isn't it funny how, am I the only one? On Sunday, there's always something, right? I, I Miss Rochelle, I don't know about you, but Saturday night, I, I went to bed early, Bird Jim, and I, I'm like, what in the world? What else do I got to take to knock myself out? I'm not going to be able to wake up. Can't go to sleep. But then when, it, when my alarm's going off, I'm like, what in the world? Oh, what am I going to do, <laughs> right? I want to go back to sleep, hit the alarm, right? Come on, help me. Why is that? I'll tell you why. Because Satan doesn't want you to go. He knows, hey, I'm going to keep his mind going on Saturday night, and I'm going, God, shut my mind off. Can I, can I get some sleep, <laughs> right? Huh? You know what God said? No, I'm going to let you stay up because I want you to fight this battle because I know you're going to be tired in the morning. I know your stomach's going to hurt in the morning, and I want to see if you're going to be faithful. I want to see where your faith stands. Let me help you with this. There's going to be war again. Oh, you know, the devil comes in mysterious ways, don't he? He comes through your family. He comes through church members. Well, I don't think God's doing anything in this church. I'm going to go look for another one. You know what? That's a battle. You know, the church is going to grow with all of us. If we all don't get busy, it's not going to grow. There ain't one person in here that can build the church. God said every member, but God allows them to come when we're all ready. Notice there's a war again, and David didn't sit down. David, you see, no, look at there. It says, and David did what? And he went out. Now, just because you understand there's a war and you go out. Now, it reminds me when God called us to Texas. I don't know. At that time, I'm like, Lord, can you call me to a better country? I mean, you'll get that in a minute. Uh, hey, I was from Wyoming, and you're going to take me to the hot flats? Are you crazy? I'm used to a small rural, rural, there we go. I'm used to cricks, right? <laughs> I'm used to fresh water. I'm used to mountains. God, couldn't you call me a place like that? God says, you'll go where I call you or you won't go at all. Isn't it funny how we want to tell God what to do? You know, I went with strong convincing, right? <laughs> right? And I went, and it's been a fight. Because notice it says, and he fought. You know what's interesting? We want to skip past that, and we want to just get on to the rest of it, but how long was the fight? How long did David fight? How long is the battle? How long can battles last? I don't know. How long did Vietnam last? How long is the battle in Ukraine going to go on? How long is that going to be allowed? I guess until we get a halfway decent leader. And we already know that everything rises and falls on leadership, but my goodness, can we get a leader? Can we get a spine? Hey, I, you know what? Let me tell you, just because our leader is that way don't mean we have to be that way. I'm thankful David wasn't. Just because Saul was spineless, just because Saul was disobedient, and so was 98% of all of the Israel, uh, David wasn't. Jonathan wasn't. We need a few of them. 
We need a few people that say, hey, preacher, I understand there's a war. I understand you're at a battle. Lord, I, I want to be on your side. Amen. I'm having my personal battle. The church is having a battle. Corinda's having a battle. Hey, guess what? Deborah and Tommy, they're having a battle. There's nothing better than unity. You know, David, it doesn't say, but David went to battle. He didn't go by himself. Not this time. When David fought Goliath and won, Israel got gumption and ran. And they chased the Philistines, remember? We're past that now. Now they're going to battle, and David is taking them, and they're going to fight. Let me ask you, are you ready for a fight? Uh, it says, and fought with the Philistines, and then what did they do? They slew him. And they slew him with a great slaughter, and they fled from him. Christian, that's what it's going to take. We got a war. Now, I want you to understand something. When they come home from battle, can you imagine how tired they were? I don't know how much, uh, 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 you know, they say that two minutes of wrestling is like eight hours of work. They say that a, a few minutes of preaching is like working an eight-hour day. But uh, think about this for just a minute. Think about swinging a sword and running and wearing all that heavy uh, uh, weight. And think about doing that all day. Think about doing that for a week. Think about doing all of that and carrying all your stuff in and your tents. Can you imagine the physical exhaustion? That's kind of where we're at. So they're tired. They won. When you win, what do you want to go do? Well, yeah, you want to celebrate, but you want to rest. Of course you're going to celebrate. We're going to go all sit down at uh, the pizza place where they've got a buffet, and we're going to sit down and drink Cokes and drink, eat all the pizza we want. And then what? We're going to go sleep. Let me tell you something. After the battle is when the battle begins. You know, we're already past the first battle, second battle, third battle. Hey, guess what? It was a battle to get a building. We're past that battle, friend. We're past that. But guess what? After the battle begins another battle. You know what's interesting? The first battle came from without. That's my first point. Number one, the first battle came from without. Do you know that that's physical? You say, what are you talking about, preacher? I'm talking about the battle that J David just went on was from the world. He fought against the world. The world was trying to stop them, weren't they? The Philistines wanted to kill Israel. They're done with it. Hey, what's interesting, the first battle that we'll have is with the world. Right? Come on. Help me. The first battle is not just the world, but it's also physical. That makes it more applicable, don't it? Some of us say we don't have a world battle. Right? But we all have a physical battle. Right? Some of us, it's our back. Right? Some of us is uh, CRPS. Right? Uh, some of us is, uh, we're just exhausted, right? I don't know what your physical battle is. But it's interesting that right after the battle, there's more battle. Huh. Isn't that fun? Number two, I want you to look at the second kind of battle. It's from within. It's a spiritual battle. You know what's interesting is this, is that Satan knows when to come. He waits till after you're physically exhausted, right? Isn't that great? Huh? I've just worked all day, and now you want to bring this to me? I've been stressed out on the phone all day, and now I've got to hear this now? Are you listening? 
I've had a miserable week. What else can happen? Don't say that. My wife tells me not to say that. I'll tell you what else can happen. Whatever God allows Satan to bring on you. That's what will happen. Keep your big mouth shut. I think it sometimes though, don't you? Huh? Can I have some peace? No, we're not in heaven. You'll have peace if you'll walk in the Spirit of God. We'll get to that in a minute. But our, our battle or our war starts from without, and it comes from to within, doesn't it? We know. You know what's interesting? We have a hard day, and we come home, and we battle ourselves in our mind. Look at with me, if you would, in verse number 9. It says, An evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul. As he sat in his house with his javelin in his hand, just so you know, you say, how do you get that for the within? That's funny. Isn't Israel his people? Isn't it a shame when your people are the ones fighting you? Do you know Satan knows how to get in here? Isn't it a shame when we allow our family members to be used to get in here? I'm just trying to help you because when it happens, you can say, Oh, preacher preached about that. I know what's going on. Huh. That's where you learn that Bible verse, which I is hard to use. Study to be quiet. Right? You know what? We don't have to read that again, but there from 9 to verse 17 we don't see that David said anything to Saul do we that was pretty smart what I do not see either but what I do know is that he did have some words with the Lord or else why would he go to Samuel do you know God knows you're going to have battles from without and battles from within and those battles from within, when they come in and they're close, family members, church members, you know, it's interesting. Usually uh, when you go to that family member or church member that did something that irritated you because you're already pushed to the brink from your physical challenges of your work or whatever, usually when you go to them and say, hey, this really hurt my feelings or this really offended me, nine times out of ten they'll say, wow, I didn't really mean it that way. You took it that way. Right? Isn't that how it works? Like, wow, I would have I would have never thought you would have responded that way. So like, wow. Hmm. Well, that's how I took it, you know. Now you're wanting them to feel pity on you. Right? No shame on you. Quit ad libbing for people. You know what that is? It's called the sin of presumption. You presume something, right? But instead of presuming, why not just be up front and ask? Did you mean it this way? Because shame on you, that really hurts my feelings, right? Or you could say, hey, how is that meant? How about that? What should one do when there's, oh, one is overwhelmed with war? Aren't you glad that God always helps her with that? Say, Lord, I know I've got a battle. Lord, I know I'm a battling on physical front. I'm battling on the spiritual front. But God, show me what to do. He does. And aren't you glad? He always answers that. Look with me in word in verse number 18. And the Bible says in verse number 18, so David what? What? So David fled and escaped and came to Samuel to Ramah. Wow. And told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and dwelt in Naoth. Huh. You know what that reminds me of? Turn to Genesis chapter 39. Genesis chapter 39. Look down at verse 11 and verse 12. Are you there? It's on the screen if you don't have your Bible. Genesis chapter 39, verse 11 and 12. Is everybody there? Amen? All right, it says, And it came to pass about this time that who? Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men 
of the house there within. And she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he what? He left his garment in her hand, and he did what? Here it is. He fled, and he got him out. I'm trying to tell you what you need to do. <laughs> Sometimes you just need to leave. Now, I'm not telling you to leave God's people or God's church. That's not what David did. He left the evil. Just so you know, uh, Saul hadn't seen Samuel in quite some time. wonder why that is. Hmm. Sound familiar? So-and-so hadn't been to church in quite some time. I wonder why that is. Is it because Samuel didn't want to see Saul? No, we know that Samuel loved Saul. But Saul chose to do wrong. Typically, when you choose to do wrong, the first person you want to see isn't your preacher. It's not because your preacher wants to, and, and it's not my job to say, well, bet, shame on you. I can do it up here, but I'm not going to do it out there. I'm just not going to do it. Amen? But I represent that. Are you following me? When my kids aren't doing right, they want to call mommy, but they don't want to call their dad. Because she represents grace. Oh, I'm sorry. And I represent shame on you. Number one, you haven't called me. I'm still your dad. And number two, you know better. I don't know when my son's going to learn when he talks to me about, he tries to gripe to me about the situation. I'm nice. The only answer I have, because he already knows, I've already, he already knows that he's in the wrong, okay? So the only answer I have is, well, son, you've got to get right with the Lord, number one, and know this, you chose and you continue to choose to be there. Do you know that shuts him up every time? I had to say it last week. It was yesterday, right? I had to say it yesterday. I'm not angry at them. I just don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear how hard it is. You choose to be that. You chose that life. You know, the one thing that hurts me more than that, is that he, and I told him, I says, that drags my feelings into my granddaughter. You know where that puts me at? It puts me in a bad place, Jonathan. I'm watching. I'm very protective of my granddaughter. I'm close. So what are you talking about? I'm watching. That's my granddaughter. Don't you take her where you shouldn't take her. Are you listening? Sometimes you got to leave. Let me help you with this. We studied in our Bible study yesterday that some people's excuse for being willful is their friends. Well, they're my friend. Well, I'm giving you the answer to that. They shouldn't be. You should leave. Well, God asked me to play the harp for Saul, and Saul said I could live in the castle. This is my home. Jonathan and me are best buddies. This is where I live. I married his daughter. Sometimes you got to leave. That's right. Sometimes you got to get away from the sin. Maybe my son will listen to this. So David fled. Joseph fled. One thing we can learn from these two men, David and Joseph, is there is sin that we must leave or we'll be overtaken in. You say, well, wait a minute, Pastor. Uh, wait a minute, Pastor, that, uh, that uh, doesn't stop with David if you continue to read. Uh, but hey, let me help you with this. David becomes king. 
Let me help you with this. I know Joseph eventually gets thrown in prison being lied about because they, she lies and said that he slept with her. And he gets thrown in prison. But what happens? God elevates him, don't he? Just keep being faithful. Keep being faithful. We can learn that we must, be, we must leave or we'll be overtaken. Knowing when to leave, you say, when do I need to, when do I know when to leave? Well, knowing when to leave is maturity, friend. It's not a weakness. The next thing we see that David does is he goes, where? To the man of God. It said here in that verse, and he, and Samuel went and dwelt. Notice, isn't that awesome? That he came to Samuel. He left. Saul and the sin, and where'd he go? He went to the man of God. Well, that's a good place to go, isn't it? <laughs> and no, hold on. And so where does Samuel take him? None other than the prophet house. The one school that Samuel built. He built a house to teach young prophets. So where do they go? Well, of course they're going to go. They're going to go where people are striving and yearning to hear from God. That's almost like going to church, isn't it? Amen. So they went to church <laughs> where people are looking for God, seeking for his answers. Boy, that's a good place to go, isn't it? <laughs> where do you need to go? You don't need to go to your worldly friend. You don't need to go to your lost family member. You don't need to go to a Christian that hasn't been to church in years. Hey, you need to go where you know Jesus is. He came to Samuel. Notice what it says in Proverbs chapter 1 and verse number 5. It says, a wise man, it's on the screen, will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel. Are you listening to that? Huh. Sounds like that's what David is doing. He's, he's trying to hear and increase his learning from wise counsel. Huh. You say, well, I've got a direct line for God. Yeah, I know that. We all do. But we still need wise counsel. You say, well, I've got my Bible. A lot of good that's been doing. I'm just being honest, right? Just so you know, sometimes I need another preacher to say, hey, have you ever thought of it this way? What? Come on, help me. Isn't it been that nice to hear it from another viewpoint, Brother Rick? We're doing a study with Brother Rick Carter. He's actually a friend of mine. <clears throat> he wrote those books that we're doing our Bible studies. Isn't it good to hear from another viewpoint? Ah, it's another viewpoint, uh, but it's still correct. Bible. You say, I, ne I never saw it that way. You say, when I come to church, preacher, I, I come and I see another viewpoint and I never saw it that way. You know how important it is? You know the Bible says that when you do that, you're wise. A wise man will what? Hear and increase learning. And it says, and a, a man of understanding shall attain now, you know what, the more we know, the more we think we don't need to know, right? <clears throat> that shouldn't be the case, right? We just don't want to accept that our wives are wrong. Help me. <clears throat> Come on. I, I, get a, I got a teaser every once in a while, right? Uh, but, you know, <laughs> it's hard, you know. My wife goes, well, that, that's not true. This is, this is what it is. I'm like, I remember her saying something on the couch the other day. I'm like, huh. I want to tell her that. You know. Anyway, huh. No, I didn't say anything. I didn't say anything. <laughs> that's, that's a good response, right? <laughs> My wife says, hey, honey, I think this is what we should do. And I'm like, I ain't telling her nothing, right? She can walk around like this. We are the champions, my friends, right? I know how she gets when she wins. I don't want to tell her nothing, Amen. I don't want to hear it, man. But hey, when I win, I want her to hear me. Let her hear me roar, right? <laughs> <Amen. Huh? laughs> no, she knows. Sometimes, sometimes we're thick-headed, though, aren't we? 
don't be like that. I'm talking to myself. Looking in the mirror, right? We shouldn't be that way. If we're trying to seek counsel, let's seek counsel. If we're going to hear, let's hear. If you want to understand, right? But let me tell you something. David didn't just go to any Joe Blow. He went to the man of God. It was only Samuel. Now Samuel said, hey, let's go where there's more men of God. Let's go where these godly men are, like Matthew Wilkerson, who are striving just like I am. And let's get around all these men of God, and let's see what God will do. You know, it's interesting to watch God work with a eunuch. We've seen it. Not only did David leave, but he went straight to the man of God. Isn't that good? I want you to see in verse number 18, and he said, And he and Samuel went and dwelt in Nioth. My fourth point is this. So we've already seen that he left. Here's what we do. Number four, he abided, or to abide. How about that? Abide. You know what abide means? Huh? It means to dwell, amen? Amen. Turn with me, if you would, to John chapter 15. Look at verse 4 through 9. John chapter 15. Before I start quoting it, let's go ahead and turn there. Look at verse 4. If you don't have your Bible there, again, it's at the screen. John chapter 15. Look at 4. Are we there? The Bible says, what is that first word? Whoa, there's my point. It says, bite what? Now, hold on. Who's speaking? Well, yeah, he is. Look at verse number one. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Amen. But now look at verse number four. He says to do what? Abide in me. Boy, it's like David knew this before it was written. He ran to the man of God because he knew he needed to abide with God. He knew where to find God, didn't he? Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of its, what? Are you finding out something here? You can't do it on your own. Can't do it on your own. Except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Look at verse 7. If you abide in me, and my my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will. And it shall be done unto you. Notice here. If ye abide in me and my what? Huh. Listen. And my words which are here abide in you. Huh. Is that not the word of God? If ye abide in me and my words abide in you. Boy, isn't it important to follow the scriptures here? Notice it says if if, if ye abide in him and his words abide in you. You shall ask what you will, and it shall be what? Notice the combination there. Hmm. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. Friend, I want you to understand something that David understood. He understood how to abide. You see, I don't understand how David made it through all these wars. I'm telling you. You know, whenever I think of wars and David, I don't know about you, but what comes to my mind is what God called him. He called him a bloody man. Right, doesn't he? He called him a man of war. Well, who better to learn about war than a man of war? God himself said David was a man of war. Let me help you. If you're going to learn how to do something, don't you think it would be good to learn it from the one who did it the best? 
Well, my God says that David was the man of war. There was also a man that God called out and said he was the wisest man that will ever be outside of Christ and God. That was David's son. And he learned from the man of war. Wow. Friend, it's not whether you got war, but hey, it's about how you do it. Don't you think it would be wise to learn from the man of war? David knew when to leave. He also knew when it was time to abide. The word abide there is important. It means a resting. Do you know the only time we can get rest is in the Lord? That's what he's doing. He's not going home to his bed. He's left his home. True rest is only in the Lord. Are you, are you following me? He's going to the, it's a long ways from his home. It's a long ways from his wife. It's not his comfortable sleep number bed, right? He doesn't have his bed tent or his temperature control. He can't bring his legs up, but he doesn't desire that. The one thing he does desire is God. He's like, God, I've fought the battle. And I came home, and God, now the, the battle is literally attacking me. And the people that you have me to save are trying to kill me, God. Abide means to rest, to dwell, to continue, to be firm, to remain, to wait, to prepare for, to endure. What a great place to go. It sounds like a place of preparatory, a place of great learning. Notice we just learned that David understood uh, Proverbs 1 and verse 5, that he was a wise man, and he went to go here, and it increases learning from who? Samuel, the prophet of God. And he also went because he wanted to have understanding so he could un attain. He wouldn't know what to do. Do you know the word... Nioth, however you pronounce it. Could they have some more unusual names in the Bible? Huh? Man, I sure wish that was my middle name, right? Yeah, we, well, we can change it, amen. You know, you know I, I never even thought about doing that, but you know kids today, they're trying to divorce their parents and change their name. And how, how silly is that? Can we just knock it off already? You were born with it. That's it, buddy. Done. The law is silly. That's your name. Too bad. It's on your birth certificate. There's no eraser. Huh? You're a male. God said you were. No one can change it. It's in your DNA, and we can't change the DNA. Sorry. I know that you want to play God, but uh, you're not God. Sorry. And God never messes anything up. Just so you know, the word nioth, or however you pronounce it, means habitation for dwellings. It, it's a prophetical college. It's a cluster of separate buildings or residences of the sons of the prophets. So it's kind of like a little, uh, a little community of men who are studying to be used by God. Well, that's a, that's a good place to go. And it's called a habitation. That was all they did. Huh. Maybe Samuel understood where two or three are gathered in my name. There I am in the midst. So David and Samuel go to be around other solid Christians. Do you ever think of that? Isn't it funny how when we have an issue, when we're having a bad time, we don't typically want to call the solid Christians. Huh? You know, I, I've said this uh, before, and I think it needs to be said, that if those Christians that we think are so great, if they're really great, if we were to call them, 
And if they were to know exactly what you're thinking and you're doing, do you really think they'd want to be friends with you if they were really that great a Christian? He said, oh, I love that preacher. He's great. I love to listen to his uh, preaching. Let me help you with this. If you called that preacher and said, hey, this is my attendance. This is where I stand. This is what I read. This is how I live my life. This is how I am faithful to the Lord. You really think they'd want to be your friend? funny isn't it well we're friends on Facebook but they don't know me from Adam right I want to be friends with them from afar Samuel says no come on child of God we're going to go seek wise counsel hey I'm training these men but God's training them also So let's get together and call upon the name of God, right? He didn't say, well, we need to have altar call because, David, you just need to get right first. What I'm trying to say is, why don't we be more godly? Huh? Why not have have a reality and not just an appearance? Right, David? Why not have a reality of godliness and not just, we were talking about that yesterday. How churches say that they're this and this and they're not. Why not not we just do it, right? Oh, these are my friends and this will tell you what I am. No, I'll tell you what you are based on what you do. Huh? Do you really think that Samuel would say, let's go be around some other real godly men if Dayton wasn't first godly? They wouldn't want to abide with him. Have you ever heard the saying about, uh, <laughs> you know, how many's ever heard that uh, that story? Of you stand up here, and you, I could bring, I could bring the weakest person and say, oh, well, not a child. I could probably pick a child up, but more likely, if I tried to get Paul to come up here, I'm going to pull him on this chair. You think I'm going to pull him up here on this chair? I mean, I could be Lou Ferrigno in his younger years. And I, maybe I could have half a chance, but nine times out of ten, what's going to happen to me? Paul, you'll pull me down. You know what's interesting? You think them godly men want to have someone that's wicked and corrupt come into their camp? David wasn't wicked and corrupt. Hmm. It's a good picture of going around God's people is where God is. Are you listening? That's a good picture of going around God's people is where God is. If we're going to get victory, we must see the war. We must see it from within. We must see it from without. We must know when to leave, and we must know where to abide. Number five, look at me, look me if me if you would back in first Samuel chapter nineteen. We'll close here, verse number twenty. And Saul sent messengers to take uh, to take David, and when they saw the company of prophets prophesying and Samuel standing as appointed over them, the Spirit of God notice notice the hierarchy. And Samuel standing as appointed what? Over them. And and then no, no what what's the next thing? And then oh my word. Now we've got to turn to Zechariah chapter 4 and verse number 6. Zechariah chapter number 4 and verse number 6. It's right before Malachi, Zechariah chapter 4. It's the second to the last book of the Old Testament, Zechariah chapter 4 and verse number 6. You've got to hear this. <coughs> Zechariah chapter 4 and verse number 6. If you don't, is everybody there? Well, I'm going to read it. It says, Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel. Saying, here it is, I quoted this last Sunday. Not by what? Might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Now look back with me in 1 Samuel chapter 19 there, and verse number 20. 
And it says, the Spirit of God was upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied, and they came three times. And Saul himself came, himself also, and prophesied. Are you seeing something here? Uh, David was in the Spirit of God. He wasn't fighting in his power or his might. Samuel was in the Spirit of God. He wasn't fighting in his power or his might. And the prophets were in the Spirit of God, not fighting in their power or their might. But the Spirit of God was so strong that when Saul sent his messengers, I'm showing you victory, friend. Isn't it interesting how victory happens when we do nothing but get right with God? Here comes the battle from within. Are you looking? Three messengers come, and they do what? The power of God is so strong, they get right with God. And they go on back. Saul sends another group of messengers to kill David. And they go do what? And they get right with God. And they begin prophesying. And they go back. And Saul sends another group of messengers. And what do they do? They get around the spirit of God. And they get right with God. Are you paying attention to something, friend? That when the spirit of God is on you, you can go around the world. And they'll see and they'll know who you're close with. And they got right with God. And they went back to the king. And the king says, this is phooey. This is phooey. I'm going down there. I'll get this right. He got it right, all right. He went down there and got right with God. He began prophesying just as he did when he was younger. Right. Did he kill David? No. We see victory. Number five, we see victory. We see the defeated enemy. God's battle, which he will win, if only you will do it God's way. Every time they got close to God's presence, they couldn't do no evil. Huh. Let me ask you this. Is the presence of God in your life that strong? That when people come around you, they know? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that word. Uh, oh, I shouldn't have said, oh, oh, you're a Christian. Yeah, oops, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say the Lord's name in vain. Do you know that using God in slang is still wrong? Oh, my God. <laughs> you better watch out for lightning, buddy. TGIF. <laughs> You better watch out for lightning. The Bible says we're not to use the Lord's name in vain, friend. That didn't change. You say, well, that's not his name. Yes, it is. You know, we had to correct our grandkids the other day. They don't know. It's so prominent today. God's okay. Here's another one, and this one makes me even sicker. Jesus Christ. say preacher how's this go with I'm telling you that the power of God and the presence of God was so strong they didn't have that they couldn't say it they got right with God One, let me help you I'll tell you where you are in your spiritual life you tell me how the world responds to you you say oh preacher you're just holier no I'm not I have to go to the Lord every day I, I ask my wife I mess up more than you probably it isn't about that. It's about getting right. I'm going to mess up. Don't Hey, I'm going to mess up. There's some things that I've done that I don't want you to do. They're, they're awful. The Lord already knew I would mess up. It's not whether or not I mess up. It's whether or not I get right. David messed up. But David kept getting right. The Lord doesn't look down and say, well, you keep messing up, so I'm not going to use you. No, he looks down and says, man, he keeps getting right. Let's Come on, let's go. Let's get this going. That didn't stop you. It doesn't stop you. Boy, Satan wants to use that to discourage you. But they had victory, friend. They had victory, and they didn't do anything but seek God. They came together, and they said, God, I don't understand. I'm just trying to help you. I don't understand why Saul wants to kill me. 
God, what do you want us to do? And they sent messengers, and they got on their face. And they said, oh, God, I don't understand why Saul wants to kill David. What should we do? And they went home, and Saul said, phooey, send more men. We need some manlier men. And they went down there, and they got before the presence of God. And they said, oh, God, why does Saul want to kill the man of God? And they got right with God. And they went to Saul, and Saul says, you guys are a bunch of wimps. Give me some more stronger men. Send them down there. Are you listening? And they said, oh God, why does Saul want to kill the man of God? And Saul says, I guess there's no one that's manly as I am. I'm going to go myself. And what did the manliest man of Israel do? He got on his face and he said, oh God, why am I wanting to kill the man of God? David didn't say nothing. Samuel didn't say nothing. The prophets didn't say nothing. The Spirit of God moved. What I'm trying to tell you, friend, is that we're at war. And this war can only be won by the Spirit of God. Just as he says in Zechariah chapter 4 and verse number 6, this is the word of the Lord. Not by my might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. And we know that to be true, because in 1 Samuel chapter 19 and verse number 20, it says the spirit of God was upon them. How else is the spirit of God upon them? Because the spirit of God was already there. You say, preacher... Wow, I'm in the middle of a war. May, many people may not even know what kind of war you're in. Let's all stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed and say, Preacher, you don't know my physical ailments. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Preacher, you don't know the mental anguish that I'm in. I, I don't need to know, friend, but I know that you can have victory. I just I'm sharing that with you right now. And preacher, you don't understand the things I've been through. Let me tell you, what we can learn here is sometimes there are some things in life that you need to leave. There's some things that you're doing in your life that you need to stop doing. There are friends in your life that you need to not be friends with. Wow. Wow. That means to remove the sin from your life. Preacher, what do I do? Well, there's places you can go to abide to seek godly counsel where the Spirit of God will move. Wow. Child of God, I don't know about you. I want victory. I've showed you just how to have it. What will you do with that? As my wife plays a verse of invitation, will you move? Will you choose victory? I don't know about you. I I want victory. I want victory. I want the power of the Spirit of God. Will you come? Will you come this morning?
Amen. It's been good to be in the Lord's house. Amen. Well, don't forget, today at 4 o'clock, amen, we'll be uh, getting back into financial freedom. Amen. Learning things that we wish we'd have learned long ago, right? Isn't that how it works? Like, man, I wish I'd have learned that long ago. Amen. Me and my wife, we did, uh, what were we doing, education? We did education. We're like, oh, my word, we just learned we did everything wrong, right? <laughs> Isn't that what the Bible teaches us? Man, I did it all wrong this whole time. What? It works so well, right? <laughs> Wouldn't it have been better if we'd have done it the right way? Amen. That's kind of how we learn, isn't it? We do it wrong, and we're like, oh, well, whoops. <laughs> right? <laughs> well, that's why we teach, so that we can learn. Amen. Just so you know, teachers have to learn, too, just like you. So don't think anybody's better than anybody else. But uh, be here. We have a good time of learning how we did it wrong <laughs> together. <laughs> All right. Dear Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we love you. Father, we're so thankful, Lord, that you love us. Lord, it's, it sure is evident, Father, and that you love us because of all the patience that you have with us. And, Father, I pray, Lord, that you take this message, Father, hide it in our hearts and our lives. Lord, help us to apply it and use it, Lord, on a daily, every day. Lord, we know we all have these battles and wars. And, Lord, I know it gets tough, Father. We have, I have them as well. And Father, we're thankful, Lord, you give us a resource here in the Word of God that we can look to. Father, help us to hide it and keep it in our hearts and keep it in front of our minds. Father, we love you, Lord. We pray that you go with each and every one of us. Keep us safe this afternoon. Bring us back again tonight, Lord, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You are dismissed.